Well, we're fortunate to have Dr. Branson Collins here with us today. He's a nationally recognized expert in integrative pain medicine, and he's giving a talk here at this Integrative Nutrition Conference. So Dr. Branson, welcome, and tell us what your talk is going to be about. Great. Thank you so much for having me. So one of my passions is really looking at inflammation. And what we're finding is that many people are metabolically inflamed. So we have this concept that was really coined before is metaflammation, where it's the metabolic processes that are actually driving an inflammatory cascade. And that's really being linked to a lot of different diseases, right? Whether it's neurodegenerative, cardiovascular, diabetes. And a lot of the origin of it really came from looking at overfed mice. And from that, they found with overconsumption of calories, there was you know, the cardiovascular effects, the inflammatory effects that were secondary to that. So the, the talk is really stemmed from that, but then it really goes into how does that integrate into people who have chronic pain? Um, how does it integrate into people who have chronic inflammatory conditions? And, and really, we focus on that and finish up with a very nice case report where we improve chronic pain in a patient just by working on their metabolics. I would love to hear more about that. And also, how you made your way into being this integrative medicine pain specialist. Tell us more about that. I've always been more holistic in my mindset, even you know, growing up as a, as a child. Right? I always, even though I really was always interested in real, the traditional allopathic path, I was really always looking at the whole body, mind, body, spirit aspect of things. I was in the Northwest practicing, finished my pain management fellowship out of Rutgers, and I was really encompassing a lot of people who didn't have a lot of resources. So I had to be, I had to be very dynamic as to how I was taking care of them. Um, a lot of them were rural farmers in Idaho. Um, they were um, elderly and were on NSAIDs and their kids were failing. So what that led me to do was really look at the underlying mechanisms by which people were having pain, right? So I started looking at the gut. I started really looking at information as how is the gut brain immune system connected? And as I started really helping people with their lifestyles, I started helping them with their diet, making slight behavioral changes, nothing dramatic, getting more vegetables, looking at things like vitamin D deficiency, looking at folic acid deficiency, and treating those as a foundation, helping with their sleep. And before you know it, their, their pain was gradually improving. So that really opened up the, the landscape for me to say that this is the kind of medicine that not only should be practiced globally, but especially in the field of pain management, where we're very pharmaceutically driven first and also very steroid driven with our injections. I found that a more comprehensive whole body person approach really could improve patients' lives, improve their outcomes, minimize side effects from the medications, uh, and really basing on the core foundations of what makes people well. And, and from that, you know, it's opened up you know, my whole passion for medicine again. So is there a specific case or patient experience that was an aha moment for you? A recent one that I had, it was um, a 69-year-old uh, patient, chronic thoracic back pain for about seven years. Um, he had seen multiple specialists. He was seeing a pain management doctor. Um, they tried all the regular injections you do, right? They tried epidural injections. They tried to, oh, let's treat the arthritis in your spine and see if that gets better with some steroid therapy. Nothing really helped. And, and, and then this pain management doctor was, was open-minded about, okay, let's try some autologous therapies. Let's do some PRP. And none of it was helping him. You know, he was getting more and more anxious. He was an executive. He wasn't sleeping well. And he came to me as, um, as a consult. And what I was gathering from his background, a lot of really poor dietary um, choices, a lot of refined sugars in his diet. He was kind of feeding his cortisol. He was going through that vicious cycle of take pain medication, feel good for two hours, don't feel well, and now it's just this vicious cycle. They need, eat, they need to eat um, you know, refined sugars and, and candies, et cetera, et cetera. So I ran his, his labs and I was seeing a lot of kind of silent inflammation. His HSCRP was elevated. It was, it was uh, 4.6. His ferritin was elevated. It was about 380. Um, his fasting insulin was elevated at 96, right? And we, we know that less than six would be ideal for that. His hemoglobin A1C was trending up about 6.1. I really had the conversation with him and say, so if we could just the, talk about the specifics of a couple of those. Sure. So you started with the, uh, the high reactive HSCRP. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that is. Right. So high central HSCRP is really, it's really an indicator of cytokine response. So, right. So these inflammatory molecules that are really sending out cascades of information. What we know about inflammation is inflammation is designed to heal, right? But when it's not balanced and when it's, when it's really untethered, it can really create damage to tissues, right? So one of the biggest things you look at at HSCRP really is cardiovascular health. But really, I look at it as a sign of systemic inflammation, right? So when I see elevations in that, you know, you think maybe there's a stealth infection. 
it's possible. You know, maybe it's, this person has some cardiovascular risk that's really not being identified. This particular patient had um, NTHFR, uh, which increased certain things that lead to inflammation. And then you can actually treat high sensitivity CRP by improving the dietary intake, improving antioxidants, improving healthy fats in the diet, and even high quality fish oil. You know, I think there's a lot of people out there with pain and inflammation who are struggling and maybe never had an HSCRP or high sensitivity C-reactive protein, what, which is what it stands for. Is this something people can ask their doctors for? It is. It, and, and it's something that what we really try to do at the Marx Institute all over the country is mm -hmm. really try to empower our patients to go back to their primary cares and give them information to say, you know, can you check my vitamin D level? Like if you're going to check my folic acid and my B12, can you check my homocysteine? So we actually know kind of what the feedback is. So you can tell how much B vitamins a person actually need. HSCRP to really look for those stealth, low-grade inflammatory markers that can really be driving somebody not only to have poor cardiovascular outcomes, but also to just have inflammation that's just bothering them and it's really hard to really characterize. This case, tell us what happened. He bought in early, which was nice. I mean, the, the big thing with him is, you know, he'd seen a bunch of positions. He wanted to feel better. He was motivated, which is usually a first step. People have to have hope and they, they have to have some trust. So I worked on a few things with him. One, I, I put him on um, a, a couple of agents to assist with his ability to uh, manage his glucose. So we, we made sure his magnesium levels were optimized, his chromium levels were optimized. I had him really transition to more of a, a paleo Mediterranean style eating plan. And, and really talk to him about the benefits. I like the Mediterranean dietary plan, and we talk about that a lot, but it's, it's not very restrictive. So people, people don't want to feel like they have to restrict a bunch of things. And with Mediterranean, it doesn't feel as restrictive as I found with other um, type of eating plans, which I think in terms of having patients buy in, it helps them to really you know, buy in when they don't feel as, as restricted. In conjunction with that, there's some evidence of using fasting mimicking programs specifically um, ones that were designed out of uh, California by uh, USC. There's a lot of studying that was being done in terms of things like HSCRP being elevated, um, things like insulin resistance. And when there was a particular macros of a dietary plan that was given, it would actually make it so the person's inflammatory markers were improving. So they, this particular program you do over three months, and what it does is during that five days, you're actually eating the program. It's, it's macroed in a way where you're getting enough calories to help with the cells that need to be cleaned up, but you're in a fasting state by day two. So because I'd seen the literature out of uh, USC for this, I said, low risk. Plus, you know, he was holding on to a couple extra pounds. We know that extra weight is inflammatory. And I was just trying to look at every, just managing little things here and there, just making little nuanced changes. So he did the fasting, the fasting program. Uh, we, we supplemented him with, you know, vitamin D because that wasn't optimized. I didn't mention that. It was about 19, which completely can disrupt the immune system. Got him on a, a B-complex, a high-quality one that was methylated because his homocysteine was elevated in, in addition. And interestingly, the first month, he was kind of getting a little pill fatigue when I saw him. You know, he was getting a little bit discouraged because he wasn't really feeling better yet. By that next visit, which was about eight weeks later, more energy. He had done the, he had done the, um, the fasting mimicking diet, and he came back to me eight weeks later with a 50% reduction in his pain. And this is after seven plus years of intractable pain, requiring opioid therapy, by the way. He was actually on hydrocodone on a regular basis. We got him to decrease his hydrocodone by 50%. His energy was better. His, his mind and mentation was better. Bowel habits were improved. So we really, we really moved the needle there. It was, it was a very good case and a, an example, I think, for, for pain management in general. You know, when we're talking about inflammation, a lot of people hear the term, in fact, we hear the term a lot. But a lot of people don't know what it actually means. Could you help us out with that? So let's, let's say that we have kind of an acute inflammation. Right? So let's start there. So inflammation is really the body's way to try to heal from some kind of damage. Right? So somebody, somebody has a cut. Right? So inflammation is going to come in and, and cells are going to send out signals to tell the other cells to come and repair the tissue. Inflammation is really being designed to help the tissue heal. And, and bring the, the, the system back into balance, right? What we call homeostasis. What happens in a lot of things that we see in, in long-term medicine is that people are chronically inflamed. So that acute phase is kind of resolved, but now they're left with this resonance in this chronic inflammatory state. 
that we're finding is driven by. Why is that? That's a great question. A lot of it we find um, is, is coming down to we're a lot more chronically stressed than we were in, in years past. We are bombarded in this, in this world with um, you know, a lot of toxic exposures, right? Different chemicals that we're exposed to, air quality disruption. We see you know, in other parts of the country where maybe water quality is not as, not as good, right? And what happens is over time, when we're younger, these repair mechanisms are more robust. And as we get older, we become less tolerant of some of these um, toxins and that, that burden that happens. So I think that that's part of, those things are part of what makes um, somebody have more inflammation. The other part is standard American diet is not very dense in nutrients. It's not very balanced in terms of omega-3s and omega-6s, which are very anti-inflammatory. And if anything, it's actually pro-inflammatory and leads to more inflammation, right? So we're, we have this combination of nature and nurture where the genetics and then the environment is kind of perpetuating inflammation in certain people. So in the acute inflammation, I think people really get that, right? Because everybody's injured themselves in some way. And the chronic inflammation, if I'm understanding you, there's an ongoing injury that's occurring. And that injury might be one that the person is unintentionally inflicting, like eating foods that feel like an injury to the body in some way, or they're registering a stress response where the body mobilizes itself for fight or flight. And so that's an inflammatory reaction, but that's happening all the time. So there's these ongoing sort of mini injuries creating an ongoing inflammation. Is that correct? It is correct. And it's what's interesting about it is that if you look at reference ranges for labs, a lot of times it's showing up in normal reference range. So these, these inflammatory markers aren't always flagging, right? So when we're, we're, or we're not looking at some of the parameters that may be newer, like things like cytokines and things like that, which are newer panels, that low grade, consistent inflammatory response is really what's creating more of stress on the system. And we look at a, things like reactive oxygen species and the concept of oxidative stress, which ends up, if somebody doesn't have enough antioxidants to you know, calm down that oxidative stress, then tissues get damaged, tissues start aging, and then that metaflammation actually becomes inflammation, right? So it's this inflammation that's accelerating the aging process. And we see it across the board. We see it in every single tissue, right? So it can be brain, it could be it can be bone. You can see the phenotypic changes, but a lot of times the phenotypic changes happen years after that initial low-grade inflammatory response has started. I find a lot of people are very interested right now in what's called longevity medicine. Oh, yeah. And it, it sounds that a big component of that is reducing inflammation that's, and this meta-inflammation. Right. And that, that's the exciting part is that when it comes to longevity, when it comes to this health span, right? Because it's not just the chronological age. It's can you at 75 still be hiking, right? Can you at 75 still be going out, playing with some grandkids and, and, and throwing a ball, right? And what we're finding is some of these, and many of these aging markers or diseases of aging, whether it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, cardiovascular disease, it's really geared and deemed from inflammation that has really just been persistent for many years. So as people who specialize in anti-aging, longevity, integrative medicine, it's all surely all of the same stuff, right? But what we try to do is we try to identify these inflammatory mediators. We try to control for what we can control for. And then what can we control for? We can control the diet. We can feed our body in a more productive way. We can control for things by saying, well, everybody's different. Some people need more B vitamins because of genetics or because of increased stressors. Can we objectify that with actually measuring and personalize it to the person? And, and as we start mitigating these inflammatory cascades, we find that not only people are experiencing more vitality, but they're also experiencing just a more robust um, sense of living, and they're just feeling healthier. And ultimately, I think what we're going to see is that people are living longer, um, and that we're going to have more and more people living to 100. We're going to have more and more people highly functioning into their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And that's, and that's really the hope that I have um, as somebody who is really the next generation of people who are treating people in this country and outside the country. From having the job, I know there's a lot of administrative burdens, 
But what's the most rewarding part for you of being the director of the Marcus Institute at FAU? I had the pleasure of doing a lot of research before I accepted the position. And, and ultimately, when it comes down to it, if you share the vision of the foundation that's um, provided or, or the person who's, who's kind of spearheaded the Institute, then great things can happen, right? So there's a few things there. Mr. Marcus and, and myself, um, both kids from New Jersey, like who knew, it, who knew that would happen, right? We're both uh, Rutgers grads. What are the chances of that? We both were in the military. You know, so there are so many like, interesting parallels early on, even in upbringing that I thought was really interesting. And then you look at the vision. One of the parts of the Marcus Institute is that it's really dedicated to not just integrative health, but looking at particular sections of, of, of people out there, like veterans, right? And veterans with PTSD. And because I'm a veteran myself, that was something that I actually felt strongly that uh, we can make a big difference in terms of integrated mental health approaches to PTSD. Looking at you know, the marrying the functional medicine with the integrative approaches, the mind-body, the diet, all the things that we know and have in our toolbox for that. So that was really exciting for me. And then to take the education, right? And really to make a mark on the future of medicine, we have to, we have to really start at the medical education system to bring back in integrative approaches to the same disease that we were previously maybe focused on a pharmaceutical approach to, to say, okay, the pharmaceutical approach is great. We love that. It works. How can we improve in an integrative way the nutritional support that's going to help mitigate side effect profile of that pharmaceutical? And in that, through educating the, the younger generation of physicians, now we've instilled a foundation that as they continue in their career, they're going to be incorporating these integrative therapies early on so that they will, they're not going to have to do what we had to do, right? We, had to, uh, we finished medical school, we did residency, fellowship, all these things. And then we kind of go back and say, okay, let's learn integrated medicine now. They're learning it from the time that they're you know, starting their first year of medical school, which is exciting, I think, for the nation as a whole. Because I think if there's one thing the pandemic taught us, the pandemic taught us that the more metabolically balanced we are, the less inflamed we are, the more we actually have a better foundation of health, the better we can do when the next pandemic comes, right, to mitigate these things. And I, I think that as a whole, the future of medicine really has a great opportunity um, to take what we're doing now and in the next generation, uh, really do amazing things that I think is going to change the world. So what's the future? The future, and this is going to be you know, a, a plug for you know my background in regenerative medicine. I think the future of integrated medicine really is marrying the, the medical side with the interventional side. And I have a real passion for that because as somebody who was trained as a spinal specialist to do spinal injections with steroids, you know, as I started really learning more about functional approaches, integrated approaches, I started asking myself, well, is it really good for us to take somebody with osteoporosis and inject them with steroid five times a year? Um, is that impacting their HPA axis? And um, are, is that going to cause some HPA axis dysfunction, they have hypothyroidism, maybe they're hyper cortisol, is this going to impact them? And I think the future of things is really marrying the regenerative side where we're using more of people's own cell lines after we actually work on their metabolic inflammation. Now we take their, their platelets out, spin them down and inject them to an area of injury. Will we get better outcomes then? Will the studies actually show that steroid versus plasma-rich platelet therapy or PRP actually has benefit now because we're actually mitigating inflammation. We're doing a more whole person approach, not just to medicine, but also to the interventional approaches, right? Because if you look at some of the exciting things out there, things like stem cell therapy, you know, what's so exciting about it is that these cells have a capacity to really heal tissue or so we, or so, or so we, we hope, right? So, so for me, the future, I think really is the marrying of integrated regenerative therapies, which I think is going to help people to not have the accelerated aging processes as much. And if they do have an injury, repair from it more quickly, more efficiently, and then get back to more of a baseline where they're going to be at a healthier structural level um, than even before they started the whole therapy. Yeah. Thank you for the terrific conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.